Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from. Thank you very much for joining us this Tuesday for a very exciting webinar on Society 5.0. Investor 5.0, Wealth 5.0, even you 5.0. Scott has been researching this for 20 years and plus he has gained knowledge from the best in fields, including Roger Hamilton. And he's going to share everything with you, including what you should be focusing on for the next decade and how you can take advantage of the shift that has happened, um, not only because of COVID, but definitely has been brought forward because of COVID. So, as normal, we have got people who are joining us from all over the world, and we'd love to know where you are coming in from this evening. So please pop into our chat box where you are joining us from. And also throughout the webinar, if you have any questions or comments along the way, please feel free to pop them into either the Q&A box or into um, the chat box, and I'll make sure that Scott sees them before the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I am going to hand over to Scott. Thank you, Scott, for being with us once again. Awesome, Lee. Well, thanks very much. And uh, wonderful to be online with everyone from all over the place. I have to say, this is a topic I really, really enjoy. And um, we, uh, we're in, the, in uh, a very intense week where we've got all our different partners out from different parts of the world, and uh, both our board and our leadership team. And uh, Lee, Lee and, uh, Lee's probably the only one who didn't fly, but after seven, we, seven months of lockdown, she was like, there's no way this is happening twice. But uh, yeah, so we've been uh, going through a very intensive process and funny enough, very much in line with what we're discussing tonight, because today, tonight, wherever you are in the world, which is around how do we optimize on this digital decade? You know, what, what, do, what can we learn from the past? What do we know where we're at in the present? And more importantly, what do we do about it as we go into this digital decade? Now, today's going to be lots of different acronyms and a lot of different lingo. And I'm going to apologize for that right up front. However, what I have done, and uh, Lee, if you'd be so kind, is that anyone that's here live, we will share a link to the slides. And every single web page that I'm going to refer to tonight is actually a link on the slides, on the PDF that you'll get at the end. So I have no doubt that um, tonight there'll be a lot of stuff uh, that, that you'll be going through. And um, I really just want to kind of invite you on a journey. Now, you might notice that I'm wearing a T-shirt and I'm choosing tonight to particularly strongly try to be fintechy. So if you look here, the T-shirt says futurist. And uh, I thought to myself, it was a nice uh, touch for tonight's uh, webinar, because obviously we are really talking about the future and, and, and where we're going. So let's rock and roll. What I want to do is take you down a walk down memory lane. And just to give you a bit of an understanding of the evolution I've been on over the last, uh, well, I'm 43 years old, so you could say the last 43 years old, but certainly the last uh, two or three decades. Most of you have heard the story before where my father, you know, this was me and my father on my first construction project when I was 13. You know, my dad did what we were all taught to do, which was go to school, go to university, work hard, get a good job, uh, you know, invest, pay your taxes, and ultimately you'll be happy, happily retired. And unfortunately, that's not the way it worked. My father died on the 1st of August, 2005, broke. And even though he was financial director of Rainbow Chickens, which is a listed company, you know, he still ended up broke. And statistically, 94% of people in England, Australia, and America would join my dad. Uh, they'd either be dead, broke, or reliant on the government by the time they're 65. 5% of people will be financially independent. And unfortunately, according to the financial industry, that's 25% poorer than your last paycheck. And only 1% will be wealthy. And I decided at a very young age that I had two passions. One was computers. And this was a Commodore 64, which was the first uh, computer I programmed on in 1983. I was six years old. And Monopoly. And I pretty much have spent my whole life trying to figure out how to marry together property and technology. And, and then you bring into it the purposeful component. And, you know, I live in a country in a continent where the wealth gap is distinctly a problem. And I just believe that, that it was important to be profitable, but equally to be purposeful. So the journey that I took 
And some of you might have seen these pictures in the past and some of you might not. Uh, those are the Jamie Steps at UCT. And that's actually my building at St. Lava's, which was my uh, res at uh, UC, uh, not my res, sorry, my, I don't know what you call it anymore. <laughs> it's where you went to study. It wasn't my res. Uh, and, uh, and actually, if you were on two weeks ago, I think it was with Prof. Veruli, he is now the head of, uh, of this uh, unit, which was a BSc in construction management. And actually, I don't think, Lee, you've even seen this, but I found my dissertation uh, just the other day. It's amazing what happens when you go through your... Uh, go through your books and uh, the dissertation is information technology what is being used currently in the construction industry and what future developments will have on the industry in south africa by scott pickens september 1998 and uh you know it's interesting because when you look at it today it's pretty obvious we're talking about technology in the property construction real estate whatever you want to call it space and yet 22 years ago this industry could not even spell the word IT. I cum laude that degree and I went, then went to London. Um, I worked for an Irish property developer and I, it was actually interesting. It was in January of 2000, it would have been January of 2000 actually. And I found a master's degree in construction IT and it was only held at two universities. It was held at uh, the University of Greenwich uh, in London and the University of Manchester. Only two universities in the whole of England had a master's in technology in the construction property space. So I went to the University of Greenwich, which is a very beautiful campus, and I did my master's um, in that same topic. I also did my dissertation in the same topic, and I also cum laude uh, my degree in that topic. In 2003, I went to the Graduate School of Business, and I did the uh, SAPOA PDP program, which stands for Property Development Program. Now, you weren't allowed to do this course. It's the most advanced property course in South Africa. And you weren't allowed to do, maybe at the time, I'm not saying it still is, but in 2003, it certainly was. And you weren't allowed to do it unless you were 40 years old, um, or 40 years or older. I was 26 at the time. But with my experience um, and with my degrees and, and, and with uh, not being very, very good at taking the word no, I managed to get myself in on this course. Um, every other person was a corporate employee. I was the only person that paid for myself. Um, I don't know what year it was, 2005, 2006. I did CRS, which is a certified residential specialist. It's the top residential course you can do in America. It's the number one course in America. And then I did uh, AIPP, which is the Association of International Property Professionals. And I was awarded the very first person in Africa to get this uh, distinction. Um, for our company, International Property Solutions. But what I realized was that to grow a business, I needed to get better business training. And so in 2010, I went to Business Mastery uh, with Tony Robbins, and he just brought the most amazing people. And one of them specifically was a guy called Tony Shea from Zappos. And it was just absolutely amazing about how businesses were adapting, how they were going online. Uh, Zappos, if you don't know, is a billion dollar company that, that rose and within a 10 years sold for a billion dollars to Amazon and they sell online shoes. And it was just the way they did it. And it just completely opened my eyes to a whole new way of, of business. And so much so that I actually flew to Fiji and did business mastery too. The whole little shebang cost me $50,000 10 years ago. Uh, my mother thought I was absolutely mad, um, but I don't regret it. it. It created an absolute step change in terms of my international understanding of where business was going. And then in 2011, I met Roger Hamilton. And Roger Hamilton has had a big influence on my life in terms of this thing in the middle here, which is wealth dynamics and knowing who you are and what you're good at and who you need to bring onto the team, running a rhythm within a team and how actually important this rhythm is, what sort of impact you wanna have on, your, um, on the planet. And then even what level are you playing at? You know, and, and again, I don't have time tonight to go into all of these details. But what I love most, and I know Jing's online and, and him and I resonate with this. What I love about Roger is his mom is from, I've got to get this right now. His dad is from like England and his mom's from China. And he grew up in like Hong Kong. And so he's got a, one of the best understandings I've ever seen of East and West. So he takes the best of Eastern philosophy and he marries it together with the best of Western philosophy and simplifies 
And one of the things I think in the West that we've lost over, over centuries, and I don't know how or why, and we could get into conspiracy theory of whether it's religion and politics, I don't know. But we seem to have forgotten a lot of wisdom that the East still has. And, and really it's, it's marrying these, these paradigms and these rhythms and overlaying it where, where the world is because we're never in a new space. We're just in a pattern repeat of something that's happened before. So I learned a huge amount from Roger and, and I still learn a huge amount from Roger. And, and currently what I'm gonna be talking about tonight with Society 5.0, and venture building and everything i actually became aware of it through roger and what's important is that you know he's he's epitomizing a venture builder at the moment in fact they're ipoing on the new york stock exchange for 300 million dollars as we speak in 2015 i went to singularity university and i did the executive program there and this is run by peter diamantes and peter diamantes literally on the nasa campus with the likes of google you know, Jeff Bezos and, and uh, Elon Musk and, and, and a number of other incredible founders, uh, the Google, Larry Page and them, they founded the Singularity University. And the idea was to push ahead with, with exponential uh, technologies and how things were changing. And then what, what started to happen is that it was back in uh, 2014, 2015 that I started to learn about blockchain. Now, I'm not tonight going to go into what blockchain is. We've had previous webinars where you could go and do it. I've, um, I would recommend the third webinar where we spoke about the eight trends in technology and the eight trends in uh, society and the intersecting of those 16 trends and the generational opportunity it presents. And if you don't mind, Lee, if you've got the link, if you could just pop it in the chat box for people. So the people that don't know what, car, um, what blockchain is, they can, go and, they can go and look at it. But the more I understood blockchain, the more I realized that our number one challenge in the investment space, in the real estate space, in the wealth space, in the property space, I don't care which one you want to use, is trust. And that is why we have middlemen. But what's happening is you've got e-commerce and you've got social media and the two are coming together and it's formed social commerce. And to allow social commerce to take place, you've got to have a layer of trust and that layer of trust is, is blockchain. We're gonna talk about that uh, later. But what's interesting is that um, I joined the International Blockchain Real Estate Association. It's been going since uh, 2013. And as you might or might not know, you know we, we went into the whole tokenization within real estate back in uh, late 2017. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later because I do think it's one of the components to property uh, 5.0 in terms of where the world's going. And then really from my perspective, and I know this is a long introduction, but I wanted to give you a context of all the different moving parts and that I didn't go and read a webinar or sorry, read a book or listen to a webinar and come along to you and say, hey, here's all the information and try to regurgitate to you. It's really been a 20 something plus journey of years coming together. Um, and what I'm going to try and do is amalgamate that and integrate that and provide you with uh, guidance. As, as Roger says, which I love, there's a plethora of information on the internet. We don't need more information. What we need is direction. And so for those who want to stay at the end, I'm actually going to talk about Wealth 5.0. I'm going to talk about the principles of Wealth 5.0 tonight, but then I'm actually going to give you a real life application of how you can participate. So we've just spent the whole day working and defining our purpose. We've been going deep into our MBOs, which are management by objectives, and our OKRs, which are objectives and key results. Now, this might all sound like hogwash to you, and I fully understand if it does, but we are doing and copying best practice, the likes of Amazon, Facebook, Google, and pretty much every other great company out there, not just the tech companies, all great companies are using best practice. And therefore, you know, if you wanna participate and rather than go and learn all about it, but learn while doing, then I'll share with people how they can actually participate to invest in the company. They can get access to a three to 25% uh, discount off the current valuation. They can get seven to 10% income. So that's an annual income return uh, paid in US dollars. They can have their capital protected. And really the question you'll have to ask yourself is that, you know, as Wayne Gretzky says, a good hockey player plays to where the puck is a great hockey player plays to where it's going. And I've done a number of webinars with Lee around over the last uh, six to eight weeks around where the world is going. And we're talking about a meta marketplace, which is 
the intersection of real estate, diversification, genres, and community. Technology and a platform at the center with both local and global marketplaces. And we, we call it the Amazon of global uh, personal wealth. And so if you are interested, I don't know, Lee, if you just want to chuck up the poll there, you know, people do want more information or they can't hang around or it's too late at night for them. You know, just let us know if you're interested in, in, in becoming a, um, an investor within the platform. Now, it's not for everybody and it's by invite only. So, you know, we've got to chat with one of our wealth consultants and we've got to make sure that it's the right fit for you, uh, that you do qualify and that it's the right fit for us. It's got to be a symbiotic win-win uh, uh, relationship. Now, while we're talking about that, you know, we've done a number of webinars and I'm not going to talk about each and every webinar. And uh, Lee's kindly already shared the link where you can go and get access to the previous webinars. But in the first webinar, we spoke about what we could learn from the year 2000 when we had the dot-com boom and then the dot-com bust. And for 20 years, companies like Amazon have been building billions and billions of dollars worth of wealth. Now, what about if you knew that the world was going to change? What about if you had those feelings back in 95, 1995, that the world was changing and that you ultimately, you know, were like Jeff Bezos and you're like, I'm going to, I think people are going to buy in different ways. I think people are going to buy, you know, books and the like online. And I'm going to invest heavily in, in my belief and I'm going to create Amazon. Or what about if you just were one of the friends of Jeff Bezos and you invested uh, 20 years ago in Amazon? What difference would it have made in your life? Or what about uh, in the last crash where, you know, people were saying, well, you know, it's no longer about owning the asset. It's about renting or using the asset. So you can Uber a car or you can Airbnb a house. What about if you changed your thinking there and you did the same thing? How would your life have changed? And I think the, the most important thing in these times is that people think differently. And then we had a webinar, which was equally a great webinar. And this webinar was by Willem van der Post. And he spoke about the scientific formula of an MTP, uh, sorry, of an EXO, which is an exponential organization. And it all comes back to having an MTP. And Lee, I'd love you to talk uh, while I have a quick drink of water of our process today and how Willem actually shocked us because he's now an advisor to our board and we hopefully going to have him as a board member very soon. And um, we thought we were very purpose driven, if you want my opinion. Um, but Willem came with a, with a, with a, as he always does, with a whole different perspective for us. Um, and, and I'd love you to share your experience of what we experienced, not just today, I suppose, but, but certainly over the last 48 hours. So for the last two days, the, the leadership team for Wealth Migrate has been, well, the Global Wealth Group have been sitting together and really trying to unpack who we are, where we're going and what we're doing. Um, as Scott said, Willem always adds um, his own dimension to absolutely everything. And he had an entire business summed up on one page. And I'm not saying a page uh, that had lots and lots of information and read this, the fine print, literally four bullet points, what they did, how they made money and where they were going. And it was really an eye opener because we thought we understood where we were going and what we were doing succinctly. Um, so we've got it all. We just have it in reams of paper and lots and lots of, of words. And it was amazing to actually sit there and think, this is where we're going and this is what we're doing and actually refine that to a couple of sentences so that it was crystal clear for absolutely anyone who read that to actually understand everything. It's been an amazing experience and tomorrow is going to be another action-packed day. So are we allowed to share it? Yeah, I mean, we've done it. So go for it, Lee. We help people solve the wealth gap. That's it, short and simple, short and simple, short and sweet. But it's got to be massive, it's got to be transformative, and it's got to be purposeful. And the most important thing is that, as Willem says, is that if you've got your MTP clear, then it drives everything in the right direction. And um, to put in perspective, just a few companies that have done that over the last 20 years, if you invested $10,000 in Amazon today, it's worth $274 million. 
$10,000 in Alibaba, it's worth 180 million, sorry, 108 million. In Elon Musk, 40 million. And in Naspers, it's 55 million. And I'll talk to you about the sales force of, uh, sorry, I'll talk to you about the sales force story later, but it's really, really interesting of the growth that people experienced. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this and uh, let's get into society 5.0 and where the world is going. Now, it was interesting because when I found this uh, dissertation and I showed Willem because he's, uh, sorry, not Willem, uh, Ken, because he's been here the last week. And he said, oh, well, you know, can I read the dissertation? I was like, dude, <laughs> it's 22 years old. It's probably, you know, not much worth, not worth much. But what, what I do remember that came through very, very clearly for me was, was learning about the different models of manufacturing. And so the first model that came out, and I like to use cars because most of us can relate to it, is what's called craft production. And so when you had cars back in the, in the 1800s, the late 1800s, they were hobbyists. They were bespokely built. So what does bespokely built means? It means one craftsman working and building a car and it was for a wealthy person. So it was a hobbyist. It was only for the elite. They were spoke, they were, they were um, built one by one and they were very, very expensive. Guys, I want you to notice that correlation of craft production. Then came along Henry Ford and he said, no, no, no. We need to provide cars to the middle class. And so we're gonna do mass production and we're gonna bring out the Model T Ford and in 1910, he rolled out the Model T Ford. And from that day, cars dropped their price to ultimately be affordable to the, the middle class. And Henry Ford's philosophy was, my own factory workers need to be able to afford a car. Well, he changed the landscape of America. He changed American cities. He changed transportation worldwide. He empowered the middle class and was really a major, major force with mass production in the growth that happened within the American economy and the rise of the middle class. Then came along, we had the Second World War where America bombed the hell out of uh, Japan. And when the Japanese were trying to get back on their feet, they wanted to take on the American uh, car manufacturing. And in the 60s, they actually came up with a concept called lean production. And so rather than if I go back to this picture where you got one person doing one thing, like their job is to put the wheel on and they come to work at nine o'clock, they check in and all day long, they just put the wheel on the car. And then at five o'clock, they check out and they go home and they come back the next day and their job is to put the wheel back on the car. I can only imagine how debilitating it must've been personally. Like your job is to put a wheel on for your whole life. Um, then came lean production. And what the Japanese did was that if there was a problem rather than just firing the guy that puts the wheel on the car was that they would go right up the value chain and they would figure out how to do it better. So it's where just in time management came, load leveling, automation, looking at all these different fancy industrial engineering terms that I'm not going to waste um, your time with. But in simple terms, what happened was you actually had teams of people working on cars. And equally what happened was that um, if they fixed something, then they went right up the process, they reverse engineered the process so that they never made that same mistake again. So the car quality just got better and better and better and better. And that's today why we've got the likes of Toyota, et cetera. But we're going into another era and that's the digital production era. And uh, this is the manufacturing plan for a Tesla. Now, you know, my, my challenge to you is uh, spot the human, okay? And um, what's quite important here is that if you look at cars and don't quote me exactly on the figures, but it's rough plus minus. Can anyone tell me what the average number of parts is for a petrol car? So a typical petrol car, how many moving parts are there in a typical petrol car? So one of these ones built by Toyota or built by American Ford how many moving parts are there in a car? So Marcus said 15 to 30,000. 1,200, 20,000, more than 100, 10,000, 13,000. But I cannot believe that it's only 30. 
So for, an, for a Tesla, apparently it's in the region of uh, moving parts, somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 moving parts. And so what this is really important and what this symbolizes is that they didn't just come and say, okay, well, how can we make it a little bit better? They didn't even say how they could 10 exit. And Eric said, you know, uh, Tesla's 50. I mean, make 500, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a dramatic departure from the traditional uh, cars. And the reason being is that they completely reverse engineered the way that it happened. So there's an article and um, I'm gonna share with you, there's a whole bunch of articles I'm gonna share with you today. Let me just go to this article first. And it's here. So if you go to our e-wealth pack and um, Lee, if you wouldn't mind, we'll share it as a gift for everyone. And if you go to this article here, does wealth migrate do crowdfunding? Or is it more advanced than this? How do you how do you 10x traditional crowdfunding? This article actually talks and explains to you what is crowdfunding, what is equity crowdfunding, what is collaborative investing, what is financial technology, what is uh, real estate tech or prop tech, what is a platform, what is a marketplace. So if you if you see us all just talking about these terms, well, here's the definitions. What is blockchain? What is initial coin offering? And then in this article. I then went on to explain the evolution of production, marketing, commerce, and compliance. Now, if I just bring it back up here, because it's bigger and you can see it, what's really important is before 1908, you had craft production, you had individual vendors, you had regulation, so compliance. So if you look here, you've got the period, you've got the production and the marketing, you've got the commerce, you've got the compliance regulation and trust, and you've got the brand that best represents it. So you kind of had word of mouth and it was like the local blacksmith. You know, local backsmith down the road is the person who helped you. Then in, from 1908 to like the 1980s, it was mass production, it was chain stores, it was branding and, and the exchanges like the, you know, um, the, the New York Stock Exchange. And it was companies like the Ford Motor Company. Um, and then in sort of 1934, actually lean production started it's, and mass marketing became a big thing. How much money can you spend on TV? You see, because technology shifted access to people. Um, then regulation became a big part because suddenly you're reaching the mass market and they didn't want people stealing from, you know, old uh, grandmothers. And, you know, Toyota and Amazon and Alibaba became, you know, digital production and e-commerce, et cetera. And then social media came in and FinTech and social networks and things like Facebook, crowdfunding came in and platforms, social proofing and things like Kickstarter. We then had the shared economy, which is all around digital marketplaces. It's social reputation management, which is Uber and Airbnb. Then you sort of had equity crowdfunding and um, you had the Jobs Act, which came out in 2013. And, and depending on what country you're in, in countries like uh, Crowdcube and um, uh, Lemonway, uh, not Lemonway, sorry, um, Cedars. And then obviously Bitcoin started to, to really take shape. I know it started in uh, 2008, 2009, but, but the world started only really to properly hear about it in 2014. You had blockchain exchanges, you had distributed ledgers, and you had Bitcoin. And then from 2017, things like Ethereum started to become real. And where the future is going is collaborative smart investing, which is where you're marrying together. And a brand like Wealth Migrate um, epitomizes where this world is going. So why is this so important? Well, let's go to, and, and again, I could spend an entire webinar just explaining this one slide okay so you've got to understand tonight i'm 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 trying to manage time to share information but to re to show you and join the dots for you and you then have the ability to go and read any of these articles in depth so the next thing is is society 5.0 so i want to share with you a video here and um it's the best video that i could find on society 5.0 it's a short video so let's watch what it's got to say the fourth industrial revolution will enable us to create a new society. Artificial intelligence will transform the big data collected through the Internet of Things into new wisdom. Society 5.0, a technology-based, human-centered society. industrial revolution will raise our standard of living and solve various challenges we face. It will, for example, free us from the stress of driving, allowing us to safely visit anyone, anytime. We 
you will have access to the latest medical advancements at a low cost, no matter where we are. AI and robots will enhance human ability and expand our infinite possibilities, helping us enjoy more fulfilling lives. Society 5.0 For the betterment of human lives. So this is a concept that uh, the Japanese came up with. And what was quite interesting is that it was the major theme at the G20 and the E20 and actually at um, Davos at the World Economic Forum. And really what it's all about is that the digital layer on all businesses, every single business, every single human is now going to be connected to the digital layer in a very similar way to how 100, 120 years ago, depending on what country you're in, every business had to be connected to the electrical layer. And the same thing is happening with, with our digital layer. And I mean, here's another article and um, you can see here, uh, this was from the, uh, from the G20 and uh, we can go into it. Here's the article, uh, no, sorry, that's not the right one. This is the right one. And it actually talks about from the World Economic Forum about what is society 5.0, the freedom. So, I mean, ultimately, I'm gonna to talk to some of these slides here, but ultimately we've got no limits. You know, it really gives us uh, superpowers. And um, it's, it's really amazing when you look at all the different areas and how it's going to uh, change the world. And again, all these links I've actually given you uh, that you can that you go, can go and go and look at basically. What's also important is that if you go and you sort of jump through to this slide here, is that, oops, sorry, where's my, I'm still on the, this slide here, is that every time there's been a massive advancement in technology, we've had a change in human consciousness. So in society 1.0, we were hunter gatherers. Okay. And then we realized how to farm. Okay. So there was a technology shift and we moved to society 2.0, which is the agrarian shift. And then we realized how to do steam, steam engines. And so we moved to society 3.0, which was the industrial revolution or industrial society. And then we figured out computers. And we moved to society 4.0, which was the information society. But we're now entering society 5.0. And it's a mixture of IoT, which is Internet of Things, big data, artificial intelligence, and ultimately better solutions for human beings. Now, I'm going to talk to you quite a lot about, about these different things. But what's important is that if you look here, we've gone from society 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0 to 4.0. We're now in... 5.0, which is the creative society. And this is really, for me, what is so important because in this theme, it's all about how much we can create, how much we can use our imagination and creativity of diverse people. Uh, funny enough, just today at our at a leadership team event, one of the people spoke up and said, we don't have enough ladies in our leadership team. And, and that's a FinTech own goal. There's a good example of diversity and we're still way not good enough on diversity across ethnicity and backgrounds and, and, and age groups. And then digital transformation and marrying those two together. And you ultimately want to solve problems. And by solving problems, you're creating value. It's quite a simple equation, actually. And so what's, what's important here is that really what that allows us to do is that the UN crowdsourced what are the top challenges in the world? And they went out and they asked thousands and thousands of people to participate. And they came up with 17 sustainable development goals that they want to, uh, or sorry, not they, the world wants to solve by 2030. And they called the SDGs. Now, number one is poverty, no poverty. And you can literally work your way around. And what you find is that generally purpose-driven people will resonate with one of the 17 major challenges on the planet. Now, Lee, I couldn't quite hear you earlier, but would you mind just repeating for me what our purpose is? And could you, for a toaster, help me guess which goal we're trying to go after? It's, um, we help solve the wealth gap. And which and one so is it would... we are focusing on? 
poverty. Yeah, so we're going straight for number one, <laughs> straight for the bullseye. Don't, uh, don't, uh, don't worry about number two or three. And so what's really important is that uh, Society 5.0 companies actually tie together their revenue and their contribution. And I'm going to talk to that a little bit more. You know, what's interesting in, in Society 4.0 is that it's all about being binary. You know, we're in the middle of the American elections right now. And what does binary mean? It's either or. It's are the Republicans going to win or are the Democrats going to win? And it depends on which side of the fence you sit as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, it's really how computers actually operate. In, in computers operate in noughts and ones. And so what's, what's interesting is that's how they're programmed in binary. And when you look at it, is that we as individuals are separate from computers. And so what, what's important is that, as an example, I got my cell phone here. I'm separate from my cell phone. And therefore, me and my cell phone are two different things. And so companies that are, are Society 4.0 or, or Business 4.0 are the likes of Facebook or YouTube or Instagram because they're separate. They, they are, um, if they're separate from me. But what about Society 5.0? And let's look at what's changing within the Society 5.0 uh, framework. Well, firstly, from a computing perspective, we've gone to quantum computing. So you're no longer talking in noughts and ones and in linear direction. You're talking in multifaceted computing power that can work on many algorithms all at the same time. And so it's no longer a one or a naught. It's no longer a yes or a no. It's and both. Now that is really important from a computer perspective, but it's even more important from a psychology perspective. You know, one of the things I took away from Jeff Bezos is it's never either or, it's and both. How do we come up with both solutions as long as it's good for the customer and as long as it's good for our company long term and so it in these uh in these in these uh, multiple dimensions and multiple solutions you have to think differently in terms of how you actually are going to operate and really for us now as human beings we've got a seamless connection because through um, iot which is the internet of things it might be sensors you know google glasses or whatever we no longer have to we just we're just interacting with the world so you know you might be uh, jumping uh, my watch as an example. Okay, yes, my watch is separate from me. I, I acknowledge that. However, it's tracking all my sleep. It's tracking my movement. Like it's 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 gathering all this digital data that's going to help my health. Okay, so so it's not like it's integrated with my life. Like I don't actually have to do anything. It's just happening, and it's part of my life. And so what's what's quite important when you look at it is that this digital layer is changing our reality. We've now got a hyper reality, which, which we need to be aware of. And that's a, a great example of that is Amazon, um, where they bought Whole Foods. Now Whole Foods is a, a retailer, but Amazon bought them because they realized they could bring the digital layer and they could marry together the digital layer with the real life layer. Now, you know, when you look at it and you look at a meta marketplace, you know, I, I spoke earlier of a meta marketplace and let's just look here quickly. I just want to show you something. If I quickly open up a meta marketplace for you. And let's go and open up the wealth diversification marketplace, which is all based on our good old friend, Ray Dalio. And you go and look at it now. You can go and see multiple different financial products. And if you go into any one of these products, we are not doing all the investment. So let me just uh, put it here in, into, so you can see what it is. We don't do all the work. You know, you've got sponsors, you've got due diligence providers. You know, if you go back and let me show you one where they're different. If you go back to Cashbox on this one, you've got the sponsor is Cashbox and the due diligence provider is IDAD. Now, I'm gonna talk just now about the integration of high tech and high touch. So if we sat in a world where we thought we were going to have an investment committee of, of six people sitting in a room, and that was going to be globally scalable, where they would know about every investment opportunity in every local market in the world, it's impossible. 
And so what you've got to do is you've got to take the best of high touch people skills and marry it together with high tech to go to the next level. And this is really, really, really important. So if you look at it, I mean, we, we're already in the space where you're marrying together the physical world with the digital world. You're allowing people to participate in the digital world and the real world in a symbiotic place. Does that make sense, Lee? I'm, 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 I'm wanting to make sure because it's, it's such an important concept where it's no longer about the digital world and or the real world. It's about both. Absolutely. I think you've brought it together quite nicely and I think people understand. It's amazing how it's changed just from one to the other. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And, you know, if you look at it from economies of scale, Society 4.0 was all about a focus on efficiency, whereas Society 5.0 is about problem solving and value creation. Uniformity, it was all about suppressing the individual in Society 4.0. Whereas in society 5.0, it's all about diversity. What about concentration? It was all about top-down control. Whereas now it's all about decentralization. You know, in terms of vulnerability, you know, people were kind of, they, they, they weren't anxious if they were told what to do. Whereas now people realize like COVID and all these things that just keep changing, like change is the only constant we know. And so you have to become resilient because things are changing so fast. And um, that's why they talk and go and look up the concept about the difference between a growth mindset and a closed mindset. Because if you've got a closed mindset, you're finished. Because no matter what you've learned and what you know is irrelevant because it's changing so fast, you've got to have a growth mindset to keep up. And then lastly, in terms of the environment, you know, the one was to maximize profit over the environment and people. And now it's about sustainability and, and environmental harmony. And so what's, what's, what's really interesting to me is that when you look at an entrepreneur 5.0, you know, it was all about a mobile screen. It was about creating Facebook or YouTube or, or Instagram. It was about consultants. It was about high tech. It was about influencers. I mean, you hear these stories all the time. It's just incredible when it comes to influencers, how they earn, you know, $100,000 by posting a YouTube video of someone taking, you know, um, doing something in a toilet or whatever. And you're like, how is that adding any value to the world? I, I've never got my head around it. Okay. Um, it's about unicorns and billion dollar companies. It's about being purpose driven, like they say they've got a purpose, and one day they're going to change the world. And it's about venture capital. So very few people get access to that capital, and even fewer succeed. And, and that's really the whole concept of Entrepreneur 4.0, whereas Entrepreneur 5.0 is all about the digital lab. It's about practitioners. It's, I'm not teaching you what to do. I'm doing it myself. We, we all are on the journey together. It's about high, high touch. You know, this is a live webinar. It's not a recorded webinar unless you're watching it recorded, but you had the opportunity to come to a live webinar and to ask whatever questions you want. People want human connection. I mean, if I've learned one thing about Zoom, it's highly functional, but I have craved getting back together with my team and spending time with my team and my community. Like we used to have the most amazing wealth weekends and wealth dinners and, and everything else. And, and I have no doubt that those events will come back because people want human connection. It's about integrators. I'm going to talk um, a little bit about this because what's so interesting is that if you take the information tonight, an influencer is just trying to get 100,000 people to follow my Twitter account and I say something stupid and I hopefully get more followers. Whereas an integrator is someone who takes all the information and tries to bring it together for you and builds trust. And what's also important is that they are who they are. There's no facade. So I know someone uh, gave Lee feedback that, that I need to improve my video work. Um, and maybe I, you know, I had it in the past where I was told to wear better clothes. And um, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing. But what's really interesting is that some of the biggest people in the space, people like Frank Kern, are in shorts or they're in, you know, they're barefoot. And I'm not saying to be in shorts and be barefoot is the right thing, but it's authentic. It's who they are as people. If you know me, I will be in a t-shirt happily. And what's most important is that people want to deal with real people. They want to deal with authentic people. And that authenticity strips you away of any nasty because you're exposed. You are the good, the bad, and the ugly is, is, is out there, basically. So it's your core and your true identity. And that's ultimately what, what builds trust. And then 
you know, what's, what's interesting from a purpose-centered uh, perspective, and I found this very interesting, Lee, because I know this has been a big struggle of ours. You know, we want to empower a billion people and we want to solve the wealth gap. As you, as you said, we want to help solve the wealth gap. But it kind of feels like we're not making progress when you're only dealing with a couple of thousand investors and, and you, you just, you know, it doesn't feel like you, you're getting there. But when you're purpose-centered, it's at your core. It's who you are. Like we're sponsoring Bongi to go to a school. We've run Women and Wealth events. We've got the Wealth University. It's at our core. We are purpose-centered. We're not going to make a billion dollars and then go and feed 100 kids or try and solve the wealth gap. We're doing it each and every day. And it's part of our purposeful center journey along with our profitable journey. And then the venture builder side is so important. I'm actually going to talk to that um, separately. So if you look at what a venture builder is and the difference between a unicorn and a zebra, the bottom line is a unicorn was all about profit. It was about exponential growth, monopoly, quantity, competition, and user acquisition. Whereas a zebra is about profit and purpose. It's about sustainable prosperity. It's about community. It's about quality. It's about collaboration and it's about user success. There's no point in having 100,000 users if they're not being successful. And so when you look at these two and you bring them together, what I find so interesting is that if you bring it into, and this graph or this picture is from Roger Hamilton, so I recommend you go and look him up if you want to learn about Entrepreneur 5.0. But there's five things that we as entrepreneurs need. We need insight. We need to know where the world's going. We need to gather the information. That's why integrators are so important so that we can have insight into how to act. We obviously need income. It's no longer just about capital growth. We need income. We need high tech. We need access to the technology. We need high touch. We need to be able to reach lots of people and we've got to have an impact. They're the five core components that we as entrepreneurs need to embrace if we want to succeed as we move into society 5.0. And then what's really interesting is when you look at investor 5.0, you know, so if you look at investor 4.0, growth was dependent on the founder. It was how good was the founder. And if they could get all their metrics and stuff right, they would go and they would get venture capital and they would explode. Now the growth is determined by the investors. In fact, I'd go one step further. It's determined by the community. And that's why I love the story of Salesforce, where in 1999, he went out and he spoke to all the venture capitalists and big institutions and he said, hey, come and invest in my company. It's going to be an amazing company. And they were like, you're absolutely crazy, dude. Like no one's ever going to put their CRM, which is their customer relationship management in the cloud. Like it's never going to happen. They're going to leave it on their server in their office. And he said, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll go to my community. And he, his, his community members, his users became his investors. Uh, today, it's a $50 billion company and 14th biggest technology company in the world. And that's a classic example of how the growth is determined by your community and, and by your investor base. Now, when, when you look at it um, in terms of the difference behind it, is that the zebras and, and kind of the investor 5.0 is the aim to be profitable as quickly as possible, to be sustainable from day one, and to acquire more companies that are also cash flow positive to continue growing. So a classic example of this is um, Amazon is actually buying a company every week on average, every single week. Um, and uh, sorry, it wasn't Amazon, it was Apple. Apple is buying a company every second week. And that's how they're growing their revenues. Now, Amazon did it 20 years ago. I've explained this um, before on the, on the first webinar. And it is the fastest way to grow market share while also growing your revenues and your, your expansion, but in a profitable, uh, sustainable way. And I think that's really, really important. And you know, a good example of a purpose-driven company is Lego. So Lego, my son's 80, loves playing Lego and it's all plastic. And Lego said, well, in 20 years, we want to do away with plastic, okay? So one day they're going to change. Whereas Starbucks has gone, no more straw, um, no more plastic straws, like from right now because they're purpose-centered. And the difference between purpose-driven is you want to you know, you drive towards a purpose, whereas purpose-centered is in your DNA. It's what drives your decision on a, on a daily basis. And the question I've got for all of you, or the challenge I've got for all of you, is that really you've got the ability nowadays, in my opinion, to do something to make it happen on a daily basis. Like you can literally do it day on a day-to-day -day basis now and, and with real-time uh, data. And, you know, this is an example of equity crowdfunding and how people can participate now in companies that they like 
because it's becoming more and more of the norm and and the reality in terms of where the world is going now you've not seen this lee um this is brand new and it's property 5.0 now some of these slides are the same because i've i've done them in the eight trends but i wanted to share again why this is so important because if you take the book and i highly highly recommend this book new power it came out in 2018 and in simple terms if you take this entire framework richard branson said it was the best book in 2018 in simple terms i took that entire framework and and yes i am bored and i am weird but i took an entire book and put it into one page and this is the way i study so i always do things to teach myself the principles and then i like to share them with others which is a great way for me to learn but if you look at it You've got new power values in the bottom left with an old power model. You've got new power model up here, and then you've got new power values. On the left-hand side, you've got return rising. On the bottom, you've got short-term risk from left to right. On the right, you've got exponential from bottom to top. And at the top, you've got global and purposeful from left to right. So if we take two companies we already know, Britannica Encyclopedia, they were the, the doyen, and the bastion of, of information as we all knew it. Wikipedia came out, all the PhDs said that's a hypocrisy and it's, it's a violation of, of information. And yet now today it's the eighth most visited website in the world and it's by far and away the best information. And I challenge any of you, if you've bought an Encyclopedia Britannica in the last 20 years, I'd be fascinated. You know, if you take the Marriott Hotels and Airbnb, I think it's self-explanatory. If you take the bookstores versus Amazon, I think it's self-explanatory. And in terms of property, it's exactly the same. You've got the traditional property companies, which are all about profit. And then you've got marketplaces, which are embracing the whole society 5.0, investor 5.0, entrepreneur 5.0, uh, property 5.0, and we'll get to wealth 5.0 just now. And I believe that over the long term, your risk is actually worse uh, right to left because of where the world is going. Now, I've shared this before, but I lost... I think it was 11,000 pounds at the 2003 World Cup, uh, buying tickets online on eBay. And I learned very quickly what social proofing was, where I can go along and from someone like 7104 Leslie, who's done 974 transactions with 100% positive feedback, I've got more chance of trusting that person to getting my tickets than I probably have of trusting my brother. Now, what's interesting is when we buy on e-commerce, whether it's Amazon, or eBay or Alibaba, they've all got the same. You've got the social proofing, you've got the feedback, you've got the, 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 the client's uh, you know, uh, decisions, and it helps us make better decisions. It's, it's, it's called social proofing. And what's really interesting is that all of them have different systems and we get to know it, and, and they're called reputation-based management systems. Now, you know, in property, why don't we have you know, silver, gold, and platinum partners, like in Alibaba where the, and, and in Amazon, where you've got different levels of partners. Why don't you have the years that they've been in business? Why don't you have the projects that they've done to date, both on and off the platform? Why don't you have the niche focus or the amount of money they are investing in the deal? What about the risk they are assuming? They're asking you to assume risk. They're asking you to put your money in. What are they putting in? What about their responses? If, now, if there's any property people on this call, they're not going to like it, but it's very seldom you meet property people that know how to communicate. And so, you know, I'm on Airbnb and I get, I get downgraded if I don't communicate fast. Well, why shouldn't it be the same for property people? Um, what about accuracy of returns? I think this is the most important one. You know, if someone says to me, they're going to give me a 10% return and they give me an 8% return, I'm pissed off. Okay. But if they tell me they're going to give me a 6% return and they give me an 8% return, I'm ecstatic. So wouldn't you like to know that in the last five years, this particular company has outperformed their base target return by 120% across all their projects. Because whatever that number is, you would then know that it's a much more bankable number than someone that's just out there going, spraying and praying and saying, oh, I hope to get you this return. Now, now mark my words, this is going to happen. Like, this is property 5.0. Like, this is how you'll make your investment decisions, not based on, um, you know, some third party advisor. And then, you know, even down to categories and things that you'll understand. And just to use due diligence as an example, you know, Wikipedia, if Lee and I want to go on Wikipedia, we can't just go on Wikipedia and write stuff. There's only 19 million accredited people around the world that have the right to update Wikipedia. Why would it not be the same in due diligence? Why could you not have people that are very well respected in Sydney 
that can do Sydney due diligence and have different people that are very well respected in London doing London experience and even in specific sectors, specific niches, specific genres. It's exactly the same as Wikipedia. Why would it be any different? And I'm going to be told all the stories. How do we trust it? And property is different. Yeah, yeah. The PhD said the same thing about the encyclopedia. Then what about people wanting to invest together? We want to participate. We are human beings that want human connection. So investor circles and badges and participation and Lee takes on her, her husband and, and they, they like have two little investment clubs with a group of friends or you've got two influencers, you know, you've got Grant Cadone takes on Dolph De Ruiz. Again, this is already happening in, in, uh, with the likes of angel.co and syndication and companies. It's going to happen in, in properties and, and, and all about the engagement. And so property 5.0 is, and, and we've got an entire um, CEO letter about this. I, I, I stand to be correct. It's about 20 to 30 pages long where you can go and read about all this stuff. But the old model is all about complying and consuming. I mean, in simple terms, there's not a property or investment company out there that all they want to do is they want to comply. So they want to make sure they don't get wrapped out of the knuckle and they want to help you consume as much of their product as possible. That, that's all they're interested in. Whereas a new age is about sharing. It's about affiliating. It's about adapting. It's about even funding. So people actually participating in the companies. It's about producing. So I mean, a number of our strategic partners are also our shareholders. So that's people like Cashbox as an example, that are our shareholders. Or Orbest, that are our shareholders. Or Infinity, or... Um, uh, who are some of the others? There's lots. Um, uh, who are those guys? We were talking about them today. Richmond Honan. Um, anyway, I could go on and on. Monty from Casara, etc. cetera. Um, and finally, it'll come down to shaping. And, um, and, and really, it's, it's, it's taking what Amazon did 20 years ago, and it's coming to the property investment space. And as you do or don't know, you know, many years ago, um, we started in 2014 helping people actually invest in our company. So not just in the products on the platform, but actually the company itself. And rather than waiting till we IPO'd, we went up the value chain. And it's all about the value chain and allowing people to participate in the company. And, you know, that's an opportunity that, that, that where the world is changing now, where people can participate in the company. Now, I don't have time tonight to go into this, but actually Property 5.0 is going to a whole nother level with DeFi, which is decentralized financial markets. And um, this actually is quite interesting because Paul Nederer, um, who's uh, you know, one of our advisors, has, has been really keeping me up to speed in terms of what's happening on the space. And you can see these slides are like literally um, still got spelling mistakes on them. Okay, and why is that? Because I literally reached out to Paul, who's, who's right at the cutting edge of the space, and I uh, said to him, send me any information that I need to know about and that I can share. And so he sent me a whole bunch of PDFs, a whole bunch of documents. He sent me what is happening with, um, with, uh, with this uh, Pittle, um, both utility coin. So utility coin is where it's got a use case, an asset token or security token is where it's actually secured by an asset. And uh, you've got the full breakdown here, what they do, how the governance works, and then ultimately how the returns work, both for the holder of the property, the holders, the renters, and even the platform. And what's fascinating for me is that, you know, as Lee and, and, and uh, well, certainly Lee and I know, and many of you, you know, we did the, the wealthy coin uh, back in 2017. And, and it's been quite interesting because the world, the world took quite a long time to catch up. And if I go to here, you can actually look, I just want to show you some articles um, very, very quickly. And I've shared all of these with you. So DIY investing um, is it's really starting to change mainstream now where, you know, big companies are saying you shouldn't be doing it. Well, that's because it's eating their lunch. You know, you've got uh, all these different companies that are all on the blockchain and, um, and ultimately all different areas. And again, all the links I've, I've already put on, so you can go and read all of them. Um, you can go watch, uh, you know, this is the first stock exchange for real estate in the world. Um, does digitization democratize real estate? This is an interesting one about tokenized assets and the future of investing. Um, the real IT and then this is really interesting for us because Lemonway. So the question people ask us is, well, you launched the wealthy coin. Why did you kind of put it on pause? 
And the simple answer is because we wanted to integrate with Lemonway, which is the biggest wallet provider, digital wallet provider in Europe. They do billions of uh, euros a year. They're protected by the European regulation. They're backed by the top five banks in Europe. And their partners are the banks. And their banks are like, we don't do cryptocurrency. So we kind of had to go quite quiet on cryptocurrency. And up until now, when Lemonway has come out and they said they're now looking at doing a Ripple Net. And they also have partnered with a tokenization platform called Equisafe that's doing digital securities in real estate. So this is super exciting. Like this is now starting to, to change the rules of the space. Now, uh, what about this? PayPal is now taking um, Bitcoin and Ethereum um, through PayPal. Just a few more articles. Um, this is a, a summary report on the fourth industrial revolution actually from South Africa. Um, you can go and read all about it and, and their uh, updates. You can go and uh, read about blockchain and commercial real estate, which came from Deloitte's. Um, and everything about it. You can also go and look on JLL about how blockchain was going to transform real estate and what happened and what some of the barriers have, uh, have been to that space. This is the International Blockchain Real Estate Association that I told you about. Um, this is an interesting article that was written by Paul Nedera, the gentleman I mentioned, all around fractionalization, tokenization, smart contracts and collaborative investing. And um, he's got quite a funny picture here. He says it's easier to put this cow on the blockchain than it is to put this house. And <laughs> I think that's a bit weird actually. Um, but it goes on to talk about um, you know, where this where the space is going. Um, the top DeFi protocol is, is now joining real estate. And this is quite interesting. It says for DeFi to grow, which is decentralized finance markets, CFI must embrace it. Now I'm going to challenge anyone here. What is CFI? Can anyone get this right? A little quick sip of water while I see if anyone knows what C5 is. Nice one, Lucilla. Yep, centralized financing. So what it really is, is it's all about um, uh, uh, kind of marketplaces um, and kind of central exchanges. So if you look here, uh, it says it here. Do, 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 do. mainstream via central exchanges. So C5 is centralized exchanges. So again, to embrace kind of get mass adoption, you kind of got to have the two. Now, Lee, I apologize for time because I could go on for hours and hours and hours just in the space, but I've shared all the links with, with everybody um, and they can, they can go and read all about it. And, um, and then it brings us to Wealth 5.0. And this is something that, that I've been you know, talking about now for over 18 months. And really for me, if you look at the five different parts, and they might, you might notice there's a bit of repetition here, but it's done on purpose because Society 5.0 is the overall concept. You know, Entrepreneur 5.0, Investor 5.0, Property 5.0, Wealth 5.0, all embrace the same principles. So your number one thing is your impact. How much purpose um, what are you? What are your purpose? And and are you solving uh, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals? So in our case, we're going after number one. We want to help solve the wealth gap. That's it. Boom. Number two, creativity. How much creativity do you have? I teach my son. I always say to my son, if you want to make money, and I do it publicly, and he hates it, but I do it publicly, and I say, you know, John T, how do you make money? Because I've taught him the way to make money is to create value. If you want more money, you create more value. So you've got to be creative as to how you can create more value for more people. High touch, collaborative, smart investing. Collaborative investing is doing it together. Smart is using technology. How can more of us, how can we reach more people in a human way where they feel personalized attention, but at scale? How can you do it? Third, fourthly, high tech. All the acronyms, artificial intelligence, big data, virtual reality, crypto, blockchain, et cetera, all the exponential technologies, and there's 16 of them, if I remember rightly. Which ones are you using in your business and in your life so that you can have high touch and high tech? And when you marry the two together, then you get exponential growth. And finally, digital. It's about problem solving. So if you add the digital layer, it's about solving people's problems. You know, the one thing that never changes is human beings want to solve their problems. And I love what Jeff Bezos said. He said, you can keep worrying about 
what's going to change in the world from a technology perspective, or you can focus on human characteristics because they don't change. And the number one way to build a business is to solve problems. Now that was the same a hundred years. It was probably the same a thousand years ago. It is a law of nature. And so even in Wealth 5.0, you've still got to go back to solving people's problems, but using it in a digital way to help them future proof themselves. And so I wanted to uh, play this little video and I hope it's the short version. Give me two seconds. But that's, that's very different from the passive investment market, which is such a huge part of it now. And that's where most people, you know, the average person has their money. And um, I know that everything's changing day to day, but I also know that everyone's going to have this question on their mind. So I'm going to ask you, I'm not going to ask for specific investment advice, but everyone's thinking about their 401ks. Do you have any general thoughts about how people should, you know, approach this time period with that, that kind of money? Yeah. First of all, an investor must understand that they probably will not be able to play the game well. They probably will not be able to decide how to move in and out of things um, in order to be successful in the markets is more difficult than um, getting a gold medal in the Olympics. Uh, you wouldn't think about competing in the Olympics, but everybody thinks they can compete in the markets. But there's more money competing. It's like a zero-sum game, and there's more money doing it. And the worst thing you could do is be, I think you can time all of these movements. Um, if you could, I guarantee you the game's a tough game to tie it. We put hundreds of millions of dollars into the game every year, and it's tough. Um, so what the uh, individual investor needs to do is know how to diversify well. So the word that I would know how to diversify well and in a balanced way. The greatest mistake of all investors is to think that what has done well lately is a better investment rather than more expensive. And the greatest and what has done worse lately is the worst investment. Get me out of it and rather than it's cheap. And unless you know how to deal with the differences of those, which most people don't, they're going to be in trouble. So understand that wealth, total amount of wealth in the world essentially doesn't change very much. OK, and that one thing goes up, another thing goes down and to know how to diversify to diversify it in asset classes, to diversify it in countries, um, to diversify it in currencies, to know how to diversify that well so that you have wealth diversification is important. Do not think that cash is a safe investment. When you, uh, most people think, look, I just want safety and those bonds aren't given, give me an interest rate and so on. So where do I get safe? Cash is a seductive investment because it doesn't have as much volatility, but it taxes you and your buying power about 2% a year. And so, uh, and that, so cash is almost always the worst investment. So you have to think about that. You should think a little bit unconventionally. Do you have a little bit of gold? Do you have a little bit of um, asset in case this monetary system breaks down and money's redefined? You have a little bit of that. I can't get into all the different ways that one can diversify well. I try to convey those things in my books or my or uh, you know on posts on, uh, posts on LinkedIn particularly. Um, but I but I would say diversify well. Be humble. Don't market time and be conscious of the dangers of cash. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name quite correctly, but Putella said, yeah, during the Great Depression, the US government confiscated people's gold. I think it was Cyprus or Greece. The government chewed uh, people's savings without permission, up to 100,000 euros to be exact. What is the safest way to invest without the government bullying us to hand over our savings during turbulent times like now? Is there a risk of that happening now? And um, um, I would recommend actually watching the webinar um, with Ray Dalio, where we did a whole uh, webinar with Ray Dalio. But um, I think this little clip sums it up perfectly. And, and really, if you take the takeaway from it, and uh, there's the whole talk on TED Talk, which I highly recommend that you go and do it, uh, go and listen to it. 
But the takeaway really is that you want to diversify across asset classes. You want to diversify within asset classes. You want to diversify across markets and currencies, and you want to diversify across time. And in simple terms, to be a great investor, you should look for 15 uncorrelated bets. I, I don't like the word bets, so just call it investments in an attractive array of assets that don't move in tandem. And if you do that, you're going to reduce your risk by 80% and your risk return ratio increases by a factor of five. Now, if you've got no idea what I'm talking about, um, then I suggest you watch the recording with Ray Dalio. However, what it's basically simply saying is that you need to diversify across multiple different assets in multiple different asset classes um, that are good investments. And up until now, most of us haven't had access uh, to those types of opportunities. I've already showed you tonight that you can go to our wealth diversification marketplace. You can get access to private equity. You can get access to property. You can get access to structured notes. You can get access to convertible debts. And it's literally built on the concept of Ray Dalio. And so when we talk about wealth 5.0, the thing that I like most is that in the past, it would have been, oh, but I don't have a million dollars. I can't participate. No, you can not. And you actually don't have an excuse because you can participate. Uh, the technology is, is there. And um, I recommend, Lee, I know tomorrow is, uh, is uh, Wealthy Wednesday. And um, what, what is the plan tomorrow with regards to uh, people being able to participate? So Scott, at the moment, um, we are waiting for approval from, the, from Lemonway and from our South African licensees to allow us to open it up. Um, so it won't be open tomorrow for Wealthy Wednesday, but we are planning to have it open later this week or early next week. And an email will be sent to our entire community to allow them to participate. Fantastic. So I think what's really important is that I was asked this question many, many years ago in 2015. And someone said to me, do you want to own a, a fish? Like, do you want to own the biggest fish in the ocean? Or would you just like to own the whole ecosystem? And uh, really what I'm trying to show you is that if you take society 5.0 and what's happening with all the changes um, whether you're an investor whether you're an entrepreneur whether you're in property whether you're in wealth you get to choose now do you want to be a fish and and or own the biggest fish or do you want to be part of the ecosystem and you know it's interesting because the market is consolidating which is a good sign crowdcube and cedars are coming together the two biggest equity crowdfunding platforms in england arguably in europe they come in together and, and merging now to create a big conglomerate. This is a sign of the times. Like, I don't know what more we could say of how these things are changing and how this whole way of us living is, is, is completely changing here. And, um, you know, what, what's, what's really, really important is that you and your own mind need to make sure that you've got the right models and that you're preparing for the shift that's taking place. Now, now it's almost like you're in California and there's an earthquake underneath you. And it doesn't matter whether you like it or not, the ground's shifting under you. <laughs> and you've got two choices. Like you can either go with the shift or you can try and fight against it. But, but the earthquake's happening. It's, and, and, and hopefully I've shared tonight enough resources to show you how this earthquake is, is taking place. So what does it uh, actually mean to you? Well, you know, to see the big picture, you can't focus on the details. Now, some of you might say to me tonight, well, you know, Geez, Scott, that was a lot of information. Well, try to put yourself in my shoes. I started with the 25-year journey of how I gathered all the information. And hopefully I tried to integrate it for you tonight into, what's it, 75 minutes to really try and show you like how it's all coming together. I've given you access to go and read it all. You can go and spend the next, you can go and spend all week if you want to reading all the articles. But what I've tried to do is give you the, the important things. And these, these trends and these up cycles are happening. And, and if you might know, and if you might notice the seven week, uh, seven webinar series we're on, this is webinar six. We're culminating in two weeks with David Orban and Willem van der Post to bring it all together with, a, with an open panel discussion. However, you can probably now see if you've been on all the webinars, how each one integrated and, and actually grew on the next one. Now, every webinar could be on its own, but equally, they're actually stronger together if that makes sense and, and how they all come together. And that's why when we talk about society 5.0 and we talk about this change and how we're moving to the creative uh, society and, and value creation and problem solving, we're in the middle of a generational shift. COVID's just accelerated that. 
whether you like it or not, it was happening anyway. And on top of that, when there's a generational shift, when there's a generational shift of technology, it represents a generational opportunity. And that's really where Wealth uh, 5.0 comes in. It's why we started out saying we were the global real estate, you know, we want to be the Amazon of global real estate. And we started to realize that, you know, if you take the, another time in history where there was a massive transfer of wealth and it's called the Big Bang. And what happened was that in the stock market, the average time that a share was held on the American stock market in 1965 was for six years. Today, it's 22 seconds. And the reason that happened is a little company called E-Trade came along in 1980 that today is a $14 billion company that allowed people to get access directly to the stock market, not only for Americans in America, but with time, it's become possible for people to get access to stock markets around the world. It's democratized access, and it's dramatically increased the way that things are traded. Um, and now I remember from an exchange, they make money whenever there's a trade. Okay, so in this scenario, they were only making money every six years. In this scenario, they're making money every 22 seconds. Are you, are you getting it? <laughs> in property, the average house in America today is held for 8.7 years. And with platforms like Wealth Migrate or Private Wealth Global or Wealth Create One Day, this is changing. It's not going to only be us. You know, uh, CrowdStreet, which is an American platform for Americans, raised $200 million during COVID. Two, you heard right, $200 million during COVID, just during COVID. And so this is why this world is changing. This is why meta marketplaces are becoming a reality. This is why this opportunity exists. And this is why we've gone to another level where people like Willem have challenged Lee and I and the rest of the team to go, well, why are you just doing real estate? What about all of personal wealth? What about private equity? What about structured notes? What about convertible debts? What about everything in the primary market? Because the secondary market's taken. The secondary market is all the stock markets and being able to invest in listed companies. And there's lots of great platforms out there that are already billion dollar companies. But there's no one globally doing it for the primary markets. And so why could you not be the Amazon of personal wealth in the primary market? And that's where, you know, being powered by wealth and our platform WealthPoint really enables it. And whether it's companies like Investec, that, you know, big, big institutional companies or little fintech companies, you know, you can bring it together. We've got a partnership, a global partnership with Offernet that brings together the digital enterprise and the digital consumer and through AI and big data, we bring this all together. And if you want to know more about this, come along to the webinar on the, I think, 17th of November, Lee. I, I need to be uh, corrected there on the exact date. That is correct. It is the 17th of November, same time as we started this evening. So, you know, if it looks very busy, you've got the Global Wealth Group, which is the meta marketplace. You've got real estate, you've got diversification, you've got the genres, and you've got community. You've got platform at the center. You've got global marketplaces, you've got local marketplaces. We started with Wealth Migrate. Most of you know us as Wealth Migrate. We never planned to just be Wealth Migrate. So, and any wealth partner that's on you, I saw Michael and, and Leah probably online. You know, back in 2014, the intention was always to build out multiple marketplaces for different segments so that people could have personalized journeys. We built the Wealth University, we built Wealth Movement, we did Genius U for Roger Hamilton, we did Cashbox, we did Zusa. We did the Enterprise Development Property Fund. We launched the Wealth Diversification Marketplace. We're now launching Private Wealth. And with time, we'll launch all these other ones, local platforms, different genres, millennials, women, um, and Shirai compliant. And each and every one of those will be a venture builder because Lee and I won't be building them ourselves, <laughs> just to put it in perspective. There's only three main brands that we're going to build globally, and that will be Wealth Migrate, Private Wealth Global, and with time, Wealth Create, uh, which will be the three segments of our, it'll be the not $2,000, the 1000 to $100,000, and $100,000 plus. Um, and the rest will all be venture builder style with local uh, fintech um, operators. And so the question for you, God, is it's the Amazon of personal wealth, or could be, can you afford not to be part of it? We've got a very exciting team of, of people and advisors that are advising us 
on where we're at. And, and I don't know, Lee, what your thoughts are. I keep putting you on the spot, but weren't you impressed by our, by our non-execs and advisors and how much they helped us um, over the last two days? It's been amazing. Absolutely amazing. And to draw on the power of other people to just come in and give us that guidance and that help in certain sectors is amazing that we can actually do yeah. that and that we have that caliber with us. It's, it's incredible when you get a good, strong purpose, who wants to join and be part of the, uh, be part of the equation. You know, the, the track record is, is, is interesting. We've got members in 152 countries, over $600 million. Um, I'm not going to talk too much to that. And if you want to go and read all about it, you can go and read our financial reports. And you can even read um, an updated uh, document about the Global Wealth Group and, and, and where we're at. So in simple terms, if you want to understand our company and our global group company, what are we trying to achieve? It's about number of transactions, it's about the average fees, and it's about the average transaction size. We're ultimately aiming for $100 million in revenue, which is a billion dollar revenue. We are behind on where we wanted to be by 2020. Um, but what's exciting for me is that everything I've explained to you, it's taken a while to get mass adoption. It's taken a while to get digital wallets. It's taken a while to get global regulation. But now the idea is to increase the number of transactions to decrease the transaction size and ultimately in a calendar year to do a million transactions with an average fee monetizing the buy and the sell of 5% and an average transaction size of $2,000. And that ultimately is $100 million in revenue. And we talk about exit strategies and, and what we wanna do. This is one of the things that Ken Williams and Willem van der Post are working very closely on at the moment with myself around what is the five-year plan and how do we create a, a massive liquidity event uh, in five years uh, for the investors? You know, it's interesting because I mentioned Salesforce and this is the growth of Salesforce. We literally copied and emulated Salesforce back in 2014. And, and you know, it's a $50 billion company nowadays. And we've got our wealth collaborative economy where we don't have people who want to be venture capitalists. And we also don't have people who want a job. We have people that want to participate and, and be part of this, uh, this rich ecosystem. And that's why we allowed people, rather than waiting to IPO, to go up the value chain. And if you want to go and check it out, we did a, um, a, a raise on Cedars about 18 months ago. The FCA regulated in the UK. You, it was like doing a mini IPO. Go and check it out. Go read all the information. It was a hugely time-consuming process. And actually, I'm not allowed to mention, but... We've got two in the wings at the moment um, where we're going through some, uh, some massive due diligence. Um, and well, it's about to start in terms of that whole process again. Um, and what was interesting to me is that, you know, our tagline here, making global property investing available to anyone, anywhere from any amount, safe and simple, um, brought 863 investors from 43 countries and two and a half million dollars. And so what's the opportunity tonight for those of you that want to participate in Wealth 5.0? Well, in simple terms, we're looking to raise a convertible loan, exactly what Amazon did 20 years ago. Uh, we're paying seven to 10% interest um, per annum for five years. And ultimately with that converting into shares in the Global Wealth Group or the holding company, it's $5 million in total of which $2 million is debt and $3 million is equity. Uh, it's primarily to do strategic acquisitions and commercial acceleration of the business. So it's the business within an ecosystem and we want to target uh, 10xing the metrics and dramatically increasing the valuation uh, on path to a minimum of 100 million uh, IPO. Now, what's quite important here is that it's, it's a twofold strategy. It's not an either or. Remember the difference between binary thinking and quantum thinking? Um, so we, we've got an organic growth strategy and we've got a venture building strategy and the two are in parallel. The returns are based on the size of your investment. The interest is paid quarterly. And as the capital for the convertible debt, it's secured against the group uh, real estate assets. And then with COVID and with all the challenges that entrepreneurs and businesses are facing, more and more of them are wanting to go into the fintech space to join the digital layer. And that's why global entrepreneurs and institutions and even local entrepreneurs and institutions are wanting to target their niche markets, but to be part of a exponentially growing meta marketplace. And that's where someone like Willem van der Post and James Potner adding so much value and helping us in this space. We ultimately are becoming our own venture builder and, and bringing on businesses, businesses within an ecosystem and ultimately becoming an incubation hub
for marketplaces. And that's why we believe we can grow so aggressively now towards evaluation. And, and by the way, model and emulate, whether it's right or wrong, whether you love or hate Roger Hamilton, it doesn't really matter. Like he is currently IPOing on the New York Stock Exchange for a value of 300 million, which is really quite incredible, all through using the concept of Venture Builder. And, uh, and then to continue growing the company and ultimately, you know, the value for us is the win-win symbiotic relationship where you've got the Global Wealth Group. And as we increase the community and the technology, that significantly increases the revenue and the profitability for the partners. But the more they join, you increase the wealth community and the digital technology. And it's a symbiotic, it's called the flywheel uh, approach. And so if you want to participate, the minimum amount is $25,000 you'll get a 7% interest rate and a 3% discount on the share price. The gold is a $100,000 minimum. It's an 8% interest at a 7% discount. And the platinum is a $250,000 and uh, it's class A shares. It's a 10% interest and a 12% discount. And then just in final notes, it's a five-year investment. So what that means is it's like securing your shares today in Amazon, but only paying for them in five years. Um, we actually keeping interest uh, to ensure the, the income uh, payments. Um, the capital is protected against our real estate uh, portfolio. And then I'm not actually sure if these numbers are 100% up to date because we've been so flat out internally. But I know there's well over 100, uh, sorry, $800,000 already in the bank. Um, there's a good couple of hundred thousand in contracts. And um, we had a, a wonderful meeting over the weekend with a, with a large investor that's equally interested um, and a number of others um, in terms of it. So the convertible debt is really looking to come to a close towards the end of uh, this month or certainly by the end of this year. And then on the equity side, we've already got signed commitments for $3.25 million uh, on the equity side. And so just if people ask us and Willem actually said to us, right, you're doing $5 million, how are you investing that money? It's quite simple for us. And there's a full breakdown on a budget. Um, it's 48% on our CapEx, which basically means the capital investments in the platform. 24% on digital products, branding and marketing, 18% on a meta market roll uh, rollout, human capacity and OPEX, and 10% on compliance and corporate governance, which by the way, um, they call them ESGs, environment, sustainable and corporate governance is very, very important in business 5.0 as well. So in terms of the next steps, if you wanna go, you can go and uh, check out the landing page. It's got all the different uh, information. There's a video about it and you can click through you know, chat to one of the wealth consultants. It's always best to have a human connection. We're a digital platform with a human heart. So come and talk to us. Um, you know, you can go to the platform if you are fully embraced as an investor 5.0 and into the, the new digital decade, then go online directly and, and just uh, be able to do it directly on, on the uh, wealth diversification marketplace. And or, and I did see someone saying they want to chat to someone on WhatsApp. Um, you've got Lee's uh, contact details there to be able to participate uh, directly. And so Lee, I um, have downloaded a hell of a lot of information. I can see we're coming up to the hour and a half. Are there any important questions that I've missed uh, or that you believe we, we need to answer um, now? I don't think that there are any that you, you have missed, except on a lighter note, as uh, Jan has said, are you wearing trousers or shorts with your blazer? I think that um, goes to exactly what you said earlier about everyone with um, saying it really doesn't matter what you wear, whether you're barefoot, whether you're in shorts and a t-shirt, it's about delivery. Well, exactly. And uh, yeah, the honest answer is, uh, I suppose you'll never know. Um, <laughs> Um, there's a good question now. Is property still viable given the current economic climate? If so, is residential more favorable than commercial considering the most businesses are opting to go online? Is there a new niche developing in a market whereby residential can be modified for commercial purposes? Uh, yes to many of those questions. Um, we did an entire webinar with Prof Viruli, which I think was webinar five. And um, so I really recommend you go and watch that because he's a real um, expert or authority in the space and where it's going. I suppose the simple answer to you, um, Patella, is, is it depends, you know, because when you, you're asking very broad questions and you've got to start asking questions like, which country, which city, macro, micro. And um, I didn't actually show you, but 
I wrote the book, uh, Property Going Global. And, um, you know, we created a, a system in this. And this is the very first version. I need to get uh, the newer versions with the uh, less formal cover. But uh, it had a GID system in it, which is the Global Investment Due Diligence System. And it really answers a lot of your questions um, because it's, there's no right answer to your question. Um, although the one thing I will say is, is technology changing the property industry? 100%. Is it changing trends and, and what is a good investment? You know, shopping centers are going bankrupt left, right and center in America and England. Um, it's only a matter of time until it's happening all over the world. So, but I would, I, you know, I don't want to repeat an entire webinar. So I'd suggest coming uh, to that webinar and, and watching the recording. Is there a market for environmentally friendly properties, solar properties, water efficient properties? Uh, would the capital cost be too high? No, not at all. Brilliant question. We are actually wanting to get a um, solar um, uh, project onto our platform. We've got a joint uh, venture capitalist investor in us and another company. And um, we believe there's a big market for environmentally friendly properties and, and sustainable returns. Um, <laughs> this is an interesting one. What is the best way to evade tax as much as possible uh, without landing in uh, trouble? And so, you know, that's a good way to put yourself in jail if you were to answer that. Um, look, any book that you read anywhere in the world, and depending on whatever country uh, you live in, there's, you know, we all, we all need to pay our taxes, but there's always a way to do it where you do it efficiently and effectively versus doing it the stupid way. And, you know, I can't give you tax advice, but, but certainly in my experience, it's worth paying an accountant or, or someone that knows what they're doing to help you, you know, set it up right. Um, another way of putting that is that, you know, if you if you do nothing for five years because you're trying to figure out how to evade tax, it's better to pay tax and to be growing your net asset value. <laughs> like tax is a good thing. If you're paying tax, it means you're making money. Um, I study blockchain development at Ivan on Tech Academy. Brilliant, Christine. Um, we should chat. Um, thank you, Jay, for the comment about money revealed. But it's amazing how many people came out um, after you said you went to UCT who are fair, fellow alumni in UCT with you. Oh, really? On the webinar tonight, yeah. Well, all good people either came from Zimbabwe or UCT. So if you came from both, then you just double, doubly good. Oh, no, no. No, no. <laughs> Let's keep the playing field happy. <laughs> Uh, abundance and prosperity helps everyone. There's no scarcity. Sharing and combining strengths and resources is key to wealth. 100%, Jay. Um, you know, these are the concepts that we've been trying to share tonight with Society 5.0. Um, the application of data, intelligence, and vision focuses progressive. Integration of data and soft skills assists talent and productive development. Um, so, another good comment. And someone said, Are we going to become data junkies? I actually don't think so. I think. With the, with the integration of artificial intelligence and big data and, and personalization, there'll be a huge amount of data crunching happening, but we'll only get the interesting information uh, for ourselves. A good example for that is that my watch is reading my heart rates and everything all night while I sleep. But in the morning, I literally look at the, you know, the results and I can see very quickly on a dashboard whether I'm healthy or not, or whether it's working or not. Um, and I think uh, as personalization becomes more and more important, that'll get better. Um, Jay said society is very slowly beginning to accept women as there are fewer double standards as to quality of personal presentation, both in appearance, professionalism of content. I completely agree with you, Jay, and I, I mean, you must have heard me say this on numerous webinars. I think the next decade is not only the digital decade, but it's a, a decade of women and wealth. You know, I think, I think there's going to be geometrically higher growth opportunities by empowering women, particularly in the financial space and the education space than you know in most other sectors basically and and that's not my opinion there's more uh, graduated females in india uh, that are unmarried than anywhere else in the world to put in perspective and you know they're one of the biggest investment groups that are growing um, in america the 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 wealth transfer is happening from the um, baby boomers to the millennials and it's something ridiculous like 60 percent of all wealth you know over the next 10 to 20 years is going to be controlled in America by, by women. So it's, it's happening. And again, whether people like it or not. So it's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. And sometimes I wish I was a lady so that I could <laughs> help participate in it more. Uh, we'll send out the links to the slides. Boom, 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 boom.
Cool. So thank you to everyone um, for everyone, uh, all the kind comments. I just want to uh, finish off and share, you know, with you um, the sorry, I, I um, the last webinar is is the future is uh, is coming faster than you think. A panel discussion into the future with David Orban and Willem van der Post. I don't really think you get uh, two more interesting people. Uh, one is a New York based. Uh, or New York and Italy based venture capitalist. The other one uh, runs exponential organizations. Just having him in my house for the last three days has been absolutely fascinating. Uh, watching him and all the different businesses he's, he's involved in, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. So come and, come and be part of that, uh, that, that equation. And, um, and then really for me, in conclusion, you know, what, what uh, Ray Dalio said, which, which is so important, and I'm gonna repeat it, diversity. You know, you, you need to diversify your, your cash you need to look at your partners, your regions, and your trends. You need to look at your emerging economies and your technology. You need to hedge against the dollar. You know, you need to look at things that are backed by, you know, things with intrinsic assets, um, things like gold, silver, Bitcoin, property. For, and I'm not giving financial advice. I'm repeating what I learned from Ray Dalio. Um, you look, need to look at cash generating assets. And you do that through an acquisition strategy and cash flow driven businesses and assets. You really want to try and invest like the top 1%. That's when Lee says, we help close the wealth gap. Well, because we want to help the top 1% invest and by helping them, we can help the 99% invest and we can help close the wealth gap. And uh, ultimately, if you've got access to debt, you know, now's a great time to, to take advantage and ultimately, you know, um, really thrive within society 5.0. So the last thing that you need to focus on is purpose-driven businesses. And also to ask yourself, what purpose are you following? What, what, what is your, uh, you know, what is your goal? And why do people partner with us? Well, the first thing is they want to be profitable. You know, they're looking for a 10x investment. They want to be part of a global community. I saw Michael say we need more, um, you know, wealth weekends and whatever. Completely agree with you, Michael. Really miss uh, being part of the community and so enjoyed having the team here. And then purpose, you know, going out and, and solving these, these grand challenges. To finish off, this is my son who was playing Monopoly at the age of five and learning that to earn passive income from red houses and green hotels is what we call smart investing. His, his dad has, you know, with an incredible team gone from not just real estate to multi asset classes where you can invest on multiple different continents, really do what Ray Dalio recommends. It's what we call smart investing. You know, the wealthiest people in the world, it's all about generational wealth. It's what we call smart investing. And we want to put smart investing in every single person's pocket. And for me, that epitomizes Society 5.0. And for those of you interested, you know, good luck into the next digital decade. And for those of you, the wealth partners, it's an honor and a privilege to have you on the journey with us. To those of you who aren't, and it's right for you, and it's right for us, reach out to us and we can uh, see whether you want to be part of the journey. But Lee, that is all from my side. Uh, it's been a long evening. I've been up since four o'clock and been nonstop for seven days uh, with my uh, board and leadership team. So hopefully I shared um, something that I'm deeply, deeply passionate about, but I do find it incredibly difficult to condense it all into 90 minutes. Scott, we really appreciate your time and your energy. And once again, the amount of information and things that you have given us to think about has been amazing. So thank you very much for your time. We really do appreciate it. Um, to our community who has joined us tonight, I know that there were people who are first timers to our webinars and we really do appreciate absolutely everyone, whether you are returning um, members of our community or new to our community for joining us for the last hour and 40 minutes. Thank you very much. We like to share as much information as possible. As Scott said, this was webinar number six out of a series of seven. I did post the link in the chat box. If you happen to miss our previous webinars, please take that link. All the links to the webinars are on that one page and you can go and watch them. But more importantly, we like you to please share this with anyone that you feel could have value from it. There's lots of information from different aspects. They all point us towards the future and how we can take advantage of everything that is coming our way and the opportunities that are making themselves known. So please feel free to share it with anyone that you would like to and anyone that you feel could benefit from it. So with that, I remind you, as Scott said, on the 17th, we have a powerful webinar that is going to happen with 
Willem van der Post and David Orban, and of course, Scott and members of our community. So please do register for that. We look forward to hosting you then on the 17th. But with that, we say good night. Thank you again for your time. We really do appreciate it and we value each and every one of you. Take care, be safe, be surrounded by people who love you. Be blessed, goodbye. Thank you. Anne.